in practice um, within the realm of cyber forensics. Um, he opened himself uh, to a brief Q&A section in the end. I enabled the chat for that purpose. Uh, so as usual, feel free to drop your questions and observations in the chat, which uh, Shashidar uh, will uh, address in the end. And uh, with that, um, I would like to yield the floor uh, to Harshit, uh, who will uh, say a couple words about Shashidar's uh, background. And uh, yeah, very excited for your lecture, sir. Thank you, Adam. So I'll just introduce my colleague Shashidar, who's from DSCI. So he's a principal consultant for us. So he has eight years of experience in cybercrime investigation, training, and digital forensics. Presently, as I told you, he's working as a principal co consultant at Data Security Council of India and operates from the Center for Cybercrime Investigation, Training and Research, CID Bengaluru, a setup under the Public Private Partnership Initiative. So he hands he handholds police officers in carrying out cyber forensics investigations on hard disk, RAM, and mobile phones, etc., using free open source forensic tools. And he advises LEAs in handling cybercrime investigations as well. So he has been deeply involved in the capacity building of police officers, prosecutors, Indian Air Force, military, Navy officers, and IT industry. So he has also co-conducted a four-day hands-on training at Black Hat USA and two-day hands-on training at Black Hat Singapore as well. He has contributed to several publications released exclusively for law enforcement, including the Cybercrime Investigation Manual, Pocket Guide for Investigators, etc. He has conducted hands-on sessions on digital forensics, covering two case studies in two days practical seminar for regional anti-terrorist structure of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So he recently, he was part of the International Leadership Program on promoting cybersecurity in the Quad countries. So he has a great experience in, in this domain and we are very lucky to have him giving a session. So uh, thank you, sir, for having, for being here. So yeah, you can please start your session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. So let me share my screen. Arshit, uh, could you please confirm uh, whether my voice is audible, video, <clears throat> then the screen? So I think I, Adam, is it, is it? I can hear your voice, but I think there's some issue in the video from in from my end. Adam, is Shashi visible? Uh, yes, uh, sir, you're visible, and uh, your presentation is uh, uh, properly present on the screen. Okay, then go ahead. Okay, thank you. So without further delay, let let us start with this session. So I have uh, a very limited time to engage with uh, you all. So uh, just to uh, brief you on this particular presentation, <clears throat> so I have titled it as uh, a primer on digital forensics and career building opportunities. So here I will be taking you through what are the uh, basic uh, uh, aspects of uh, digital forensics and what is the market for uh, cybersecurity industry and, uh, and uh, what is the demand for uh, cybersecurity professionals, especially digital forensics, uh, uh, what do you call uh, specialists? There's a lot of demand. So let me show you the uh, facts about that. And also, I would uh, like to cover some of the important uh, case scenarios so that uh, you will get the uh, get to know the what are the importance of uh, digital forensics. And what are the advanced techniques that we can uh, incorporate in uh, this particular field? And, uh, and uh, when I say advanced, it's not that it's an ultimate uh, solution for our uh, whatever we are doing. So uh, we have a lot of challenges. So whenever I say challenge in this particular seminar, in this particular uh, webinar, so you think that as an opportunity. Okay. Wherever I say challenges when it comes to legal aspects, the lawyers can definitely work on that. Whenever I say technical challenges, the definitely the uh, student from the technical background can definitely uh, help in that particular uh, area. So at last, I will be uh, uh, taking you through what are the uh, things that you need to concentrate at the student level to get into the position of uh, digital forensics or cybersecurity. 
So I will be mainly concentrating on digital forensics, but uh, briefly explaining on cybersecurity. So I will be explaining you seven step uh, uh, procedure to reach your goal in this particular uh, webinar. So this is the quote which I wanted to tell you before beginning this particular session. So find out uh, what you like. Uh, doing best and uh, get someone to pay you for doing it. So this is where uh, you can get the job. So this is said by uh, Catherine. Uh, so she is a uh, journalist. Uh, so this you need to keep in mind so that your life will be uh, very good in future. So with this uh, quote, uh, let me uh, take you to the uh, the facts that we are dealing with now. So when we look at the NCRB statistics, we can see that there is a uh, gradual uh, increase in the number of cases which is reported. And don't forget that there are a lot of cases which is not reported. Okay, so these are the reported cases. When we compare from 2012 to 2021, we have seen a lot of drastic uh, increment in this particular area. So one is the usage of technology by non-technical or uh, the layman and they are uh, calling it to the many of the what you call frauds and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, police force is required in this area to deal with such cases so coming to next uh, you all know about uh, computer emergency response team india 13 so they have registered lot of cases when come when we compare with 2018 to 2021, we have we have seen a lot of uh, uh, cases which is registered. And also there is a directive from the certain recently which says every uh, breach or attack on any of the corporate should be. Should be uh, noticed uh, to the uh, what you call assert India. So that we have seen a lot of uh, cases. Even till February, we have reached two lakh twelve. So past uh, 2021, we have uh, seen around 14 lakh plus. So these are the registered breach of attacks, but there are unregistered and many other attacks is happening. So when we uh, look at the survey, which is done by very uh, eminent uh, companies like uh, uh, McKinsey. So it says new survey reveals dollar two trillion market opportunity for cybersecurity technology and service providers. Because see, everything is moving to the cyber. So there is a lot of requirement for the cybersecurity professionals in, in this area to secure their content and manage, put the controls. There are many things to deal with. When it comes to digital forensics, the market is very much growing. You have you can you can see uh, in the past decade and also uh, when it comes to the next decade also, you can see that the market will there is some uh, what you call prediction which the FMI has done. So it says it will reach the market uh, of dollar twenty three point six two billion by twenty thirty. So when when we look at these reports, we can def definitely think that this field is growing a lot, and also there is a lot of opportunity. So let us uh, uh, think as the as a job seeker or career building in this particular area, whether it is reliable or whether I have the future in this particular thing. I need to think now. So let us think over that. So when we look up some of the facts, uh, we have seen. Uh, Many of the senior uh, cyber security researchers have told that. So this is a uh, like every day the cyber attacks are growing that we are seeing in many of the uh, newspaper and many of the uh, what you call uh, other channels. So the demand of cyber security professionals will continue to grow in this scale. So what what's my personal opinion is it will exponentially grow in upcoming days. So this is. Uh, the thing which is uh, which is said by uh, Jason John, a former cybersecurity chief from Netflix. So again, at what scale this will rise? 
So over in eight years, if you take for an eight years, what has happened? If you look at at the back, so the the number of uh, unfilled cyber security jobs grew by three fifty percent. So just imagine the scale of uh, this particular thing. So from one billion position in twenty thirteen, now it has reached to three point five billion in twenty twenty one. So this is a survey which is done by uh, Cyber Security Ventures. So which will uh, ensure that yes, we have or we have uh, scope in this particular field. We have uh, less players, more challenges, and also more money. So coming to what are the uh, challenges uh, that we are facing in this particular area? Is one is you have you all know about this. this is there are uh, something called as. Uh, something uh, called as uh, AI enabled these kind of deep fake, which is fooling lot of people and also creating lot of uh, havoc in the system and fooling the people and also most of the what I call credential stealing or many of the uh, traditional attacks have taken this particular uh, technology to fool the people and get the money out of it. See how it works. So I'm not talking about this threat. I'm talking about what is the solution to identify this? That is the thing which I am talking. So as of now, there is no thing to detect this particular uh, deep fake. That is one part. And other part is there is an automation is required for this particular detection. So we already got this fact check dot ksp dot gov dot in, which is from the Karnataka State Police, where we can check the fact, putting the fake news or any uh, news to verify whether it's fake or not. But this should be automated. How this can be automated? So that is left to you. You need to figure out how this can be automated. So there are a lot of cases. I have just put one or two. There are a lot of things. So when it comes to in, uh, instant loan app, so you have read newspaper and all. So there are a lot of harassment by online loan app uh, well, providers. Uh, which has led to the suicide of many of the personnel, which include students of the working professionals and all. Recently, we have seen a lot of uh, such cases. How to detect this, uh, what do you call, at the beginning stage and to apprise the user to avoid this? So we need to figure it out how, what is the mechanism and all. Whether the technical, it is not only a technical issue, this may be a legal issue as well. What are the uh, rules and responsibility that we can lay out on this particular uh, thing to curb this kind of uh, fraud? And another part is the gaming applications and uh, uh, many of the other uh, sort of uh, applications which are in the uh, Play Store, Google, uh, the App Store, and uh, many of the other uh, sites. So how we can uh, Say that yes, this can be used or this can be used for the first person and also preserve the privacy. So there are a lot of things that the law students can also work on this area. So when it comes to digital evidence and its nature, so this in uh, many of the law students have joined, I think, so when it comes to cyber law, we use this uh, Information Technology Act 2000, amended 2008. So it is amended in 2008. It's already 10 plus years now. So still we have not got any amendments. There are still it is in the process. So when I when we look at this old content, it says that this electronic form of evidence has any information of probative value that is either stored or transmitted in electronic form and includes computer evidence, digital audio, digital video, cell phones, and digital fax machines. So can we stop here? No. There are a lot of devices which is coming in the market. It is like an, I can say it's an exponential growth in the market of this particular digital media. So as a user, I'm very happy to use these kind of devices, very much happy. But whatever the device you look into, like for example, Internet of Things, I'm very much happy to use those devices, smartwatch, smart TV, smart AC, smart washing machine, smart uh, everything is smart right so i am very happy but when it comes to investigation 
when the police officer sees these kind of devices and try to analyze it so just imagine the pain what they get in this particular thing so how much time is required how much efforts is required how how to get the data maximum data in this particular uh, devices so those are the uh, very uh, very important things that we need to work on so i will show you a video so whatever the device you see we should do the forensics on that to extract the content analyze it and we need to relate that to the case so that this evidence may be helpful in uh, proving or disproving the case we are about to wake up to a new world the world of the internet of things don't worry it just means that objects will be able to speak to each other they'll do our work for us and look after us so now, these are the devices which we need to concentrate on they'll be able to react to our movements they'll understand when we want some peace and quiet or when we want to get information and news or just have a nice breakfast in fact the internet of things already exists Many everyday objects are already part of it, some a bit too much. Intelligent objects will improve our interaction with the environment and our work. And as they're intelligent, why not have them do some work on our behalf? So we can concentrate on what we enjoy. Meanwhile, the objects will collect data and take care of us. The Internet of Things will help us save money. Do the shopping. Avoid lines. All lines. Step by step, the Internet of Things is on its way. We're working on it at this very moment. How about you? Are you ready to wake up to a new world? we have seen a video which will the user will definitely enjoy but when it comes to investigation so if there is something some case which is related to this when you get into the residence of a person which is smart which is which is a smart home and you try to see something so you will get these devices in your uh, what do you call seizure list so then you need to figure out how I can able to extract the maximum content out of it and and also the scale which uh, we are looking at is very high so we need to figure out how to get the exact uh, what you call uh, content in this particular uh, area <coughs> so let us see how the uh, scaling up of data as seen in, in the view of uh, digital forensic examiner so as I told you uh, earlier, uh, nowadays the phone, uh, the smartphone is coming up with one TB. So as a user, I'm very much happy. But when it comes to investigation, when we seize this phone, the first issue is how to break the security. So that is first is issue. Second issue, if it is one TB data, how I can analyze one TB of data to find the relevant artifacts which relate to our case so it's very difficult for any of the examiner to do so so there is there should be some automation which is very much required it's not the luxury which i am talking to it's very much required nowadays for the law enforcement to uh, speed up their investigation and also uh, pinpoint particular evidence which will definitely help in reducing the time reducing the manpower and also effective investigation also it could help. So there is something called uh, uh, adoption of AI, which has happened uh, in digital forensics as well, because there are a lot of uh, messages, lot of images, how you can correlate, how you can read those messages, whether it's a negative message, positive message, these data analytics will definitely help in identifying these patterns, connections, and also this image recognition capabilities is also helping the uh, examiners in a 
very different way altogether. So let me give you an example for that. So when it comes to uh, any of the device, as I told you, if you take up uh, a mobile phone which has capacity of 1 TB, so and I am interested in identifying some of this uh, particular. OK, so some of this particular. Uh, objects, people and and particular. Uh, uh, what you call places, how can I figure out? So let me zoom it a bit. So let me give you an example. I have selected a threat category as alcohol. I have 20 to 25,000 images in this particular uh, uh, case, but now I can minimize that. See, very less amount of uh, alcohol images I, I can see. There are some cases which includes this kind of currency, so it is showing up only the currency images. And when it comes to any uh, sort of uh, credit card, debit card uh, related fraud, we can also pinpoint only those credit card, ID card, and also the debit card information. So this will help the uh, law enforcement or any digital forensic examiner to reduce the time and energy. So coming to uh, the concepts of digital forensics, so you need to understand what is digital forensics before getting into any of the career or thinking about that. You need to have full understanding. So most of them know digital forensics is all like uh, data recovery. People are aware of that, but it's not only data recovery. So when it comes to digital forensics, we do analysis on the devices. We extract the content from that and we do analysis reporting. So we do a lot of uh, uh, process, but at the end we need to remember one thing. So whatever we do, it should be in a forensically sound manner. So when I say forensically sound manner, which means to say at the back of my, my, my mind, I need to have one thing, whatever the evidence I get while doing the analysis, I should, I should provide that to the court and it should be admissible in the court of law. If it is not admissible, then it's of no use. OK, but data recovery, it's not that you can use any technique to uh, recover the data. But here we do the same. But the thing is we need to follow some of the procedures, legal aspects also included in this. And there are some forensically sound method which we can implement and we can get the data out of it. So what are the data that we are dealing with? One is the active data, archival and ten, uh, latent uh, data. So active data is the data which you can look into it's a, like a backup. Archival data is nothing but uh, the data which is stored in cloud and many other places. Latent data is the data which is deleted and it recoverable data. So what is the goal of this particular forensic uh, digital forensic investigation is to identify the potential digital evidence to support investigation and also extract and examine the evidence at last but very very important is presentation in the court of law there, there may be a lot of law students here so this is very very difficult to say how we can do this particular uh, evidence which is presentable in the court of law so there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of challenges which you can work on. So next coming to what this particular digital forensic can reveal. So George uh, Robin has uh, highlighted several things. One is. You, you need to protect that particular device from any alteration, damage, corruption or introduction of any of the virus and malware in this particular. Uh, suspect system, I can say because that will Aid to aid to, uh, it's not admissible in the court of law. If admissible, admissible also, the defense may take a uh, what you call uh, say that it may it is not admissible because because it has tampered by the investigating officer or forensic examiner. Okay, we need to follow this chain of custody procedures, everything in this particular regard. So what we can discover in this particular system is one is the existing active files, deleted yet remaining files, then hidden files, then protected files and encrypted files. These are th there are a lot of challenges. Let me let me uh, uh, share some of the challenges at the end. So this is the potential evidence which we can acquire from the RAM dump. 
so nowadays uh, there is a uh, shift from data extraction from the disk to the ram so there are two reasons one is there are a lot of active malware which is only available in the ram but it's not available in the disk because there is a introduction of fileless malware where it will inject the code directly to the memory space of the process which is running in the ram and it will execute the things it will in fact it will exfiltrate the data and it will suicide by itself so it will not leave any traces on the disk only traces few traces which we can identify is in the ram and only we can do it to the live environment so here uh, we can get a lot of uh, information uh, for example process what is running uh, what is the current process which is running what is, who is the current user malware network uh, connection what it is making then encryption keys uh, uh, i am doing some work on that uh, we can also identify that and also some of the windows registry keys event logs open files so i have opened this P, uh, ppt and it's opened in the ram so there are some traces of this ppt where i can find in the ram so that can also be identified so coming to disk forensics we can also able to identify what are the devices that is connected to this de uh, this particular device who, who are what, what that i have uh, uh, very much interested in so like browsing history even deleted we can also recover that file folder opening then account usage what are the files that i have downloaded is any malware executed in this particular time frame you can also do some of the timeline analysis to figure out what has happened what is the event one after the other to understand the behavior of the uh, what do you call uh, victim or the criminal okay so john uh, waka is also one of the security researcher who who has applied some of the test on forensic evidence. What is that we need to apply on any of the forensic evidence? One is, is the evidence authentic? Okay. So whether the evidence come from the source where we are intended to, or it has come from any other sources. So is the evidence reliable? This, this comes under whether the whatever we have extracted, it is reliable. To say that yes this is the one which we are looking for then is the evidence complete in the sense we can't able to uh, what you call extract the partial content and, and tell the story it should tell the story uh, for example we can say that there should be some correlation between the two devices where the same number is used or same image is used in the both uh, both evidence so last is, is the evidence free from uh, interference and contamination, whether it is infected by malware. Where, uh, when I say malware, it's, it's not that uh, the regular infection which I am talking to. When I say it is infected by the malware, whether it has made any changes in the media or it has added something, it has deleted something. So these are the things which we need to concentrate. So what is the purpose of for this digital forensics examination? So we need to, we need to uh, figure out who has done this, what, what has happened, when it has happened, where this has happened, why it, this particular event has happened, and how these things have happened in this particular system or any device or media you can say. So there is uh, Inman and Brodin has said a very good quote in this particular uh, thing. Before the criminalist ever picks up a magnifying glass, pipette, or chemical reagent, he must define a question that science can answer. So whenever you start the investigation or the examination, you should be in a position to frame the questions which the forensics or science can answer in this particular way. If not, then we will end up with wrong results. So I'm going very quick, uh, just wanted to make you understand the importance of digital forensics, then I will get into the career opportunities. So what can I expect? Investigating officer expect from digital forensic analysis. One is the data recovery, volatile evidence analysis. Volatile uh, evidence analysis is nothing but the RAM analysis, or you can also say hyperfill.ses system analysis. Then timeline analysis, which mainly based on the 
event which took place on the time frame. Malware analysis, where we have a sample and analyze to find out what type of sample is this, which category it belongs, what is the behavior, what is the damage it is ma making, so those things. File system analysis is nothing but how the data is stored in that particular file system, when it was altered, who altered it, and what is the alteration involved. Smartphone analysis is one area where uh, law enforcement is uh, very much uh, uh, what you call working on uh, because uh, there's a lot of phone which is uh, seized and also uh, there is very very less capabilities in digital forensic area to uh, cope up with the demand so there is a lot of opportunities for many of the uh, students to work on this and also when it comes to smartphone every day the new phone is released it has new architecture new operating system new security patch Again, the forensic uh, examiner or the researcher should work towards finding out or breaking the security, also extracting the content. So a lot more to done in this area. So network analysis that is mainly on the corporate side, uh, it's, it's uh, very, very essential to understand the behavior of uh, any of the employees in this regard, mainly on data theft and other uh, cases. So what uh, this digital forensics uh, uh, process look like? So one is the preparation stage, which includes the activities where you are prepared and you have the equipments which is ready to uh, do these uh, upcoming uh, steps. So identification is nothing but uh, it's it's nothing but the detection of uh, the particular suspicious activity or incident itself or any criminal case. Next, uh, the collection. Collection, we have a lot of uh, issues actually because we need to collect the uh, what, you call, uh, what you call data, which is maximum enough to uh, what you call uh, prove or disprove the case. And also, it has a lot of uh, procedural aspects which we need to follow. And we call it as best practices to search and seize the uh, evidences which require a lot of efforts um, from the law enforcement agencies to make it advisable in the court of law. So preservation again, uh, uh, preservation again you need to prove that chain of custody. So chain of custody is nothing but uh, the uh, from the seizure to till the uh, what you call trial, what is the uh, things that you have done on that particular uh, artifact sorry media uh, that is very very important to maintain that documentation next examination is evaluating uh, what you call uh, uh, what you call data whether it is very much important to the case or it is irrelevant you need to identify in that stage when coming to the analysis these uh, tools will definitely help uh, in analysis like it will give the classified view where we can pinpoint what is required, whether we are interested in documents, whether we are inter interested in multimedia, or whether we are interested in some encrypted files, protected files. So that in that way, this will definitely help. And this is the place where the lot of energy and lot of time is put by the uh, forensic examiner to uh, do the analysis. The presentation, yes, it's uh, it's all about uh, how you prepare the report. Because as I told you, 1TB is the media and you are uh, extracting, analyzing, and you will get a lot of uh, results. When you just click on generate report, it will give 1,000 pages. Whether that can be presented in the court of law? No. Whether that can be presented to your seniors? No. Because it it is like overloaded with data. I mean, you need to figure out which is very important how you relate to the case is very, very important and how to how you, uh, you know, create such story uh, beyond that which is acceptable. So let us uh, get into the advanced digital forensic techniques. So this is an advanced uh, digital forensic techniques which I am talking to where electronic students definitely can help in this. So one is uh, data recovery from damaged hard disk where they will dismantle the hard disk and they will try to figure out what is the issue and in the clean room they will replace all the platters and try to read it 
Okay. These also have a lot of challenges which the students should take up. So data recovery from the damaged pen drive and, pay, uh, and memory card. We have these capabilities in, uh, in our uh, center and we are using this and we have done a lot of cases. But it, it has its own challenges. Let me let me tell the challenges at the end. So this is the SD card. If this normal if this normal interface is unable to read the data, we will identify the pinouts here and we will put it in the this is a spider board spider board. We will put it in this and we'll pin this to like 18, 17, and all. We we'll place this under microscope, then we will connect to this PC 3000 flash. So this is an ACE laboratory which has this capability uh, to extract the content. So similar with the pen drives also, if the normal interface is not is unable to extract the data, we need to uh, uh, do the chip off uh, using the heating mechanism and we need to read that particular data. So compared to uh, the mobile and other uh, devices reading the data from SD card and pen drive SSD mainly it's very very difficult because it's not only the chip we, where we can read the data it is a controller which we need to simulate which is very very difficult because even with the um, solutions like PC3000 we have a lot of uh, uh, permutation combinations that we need to do based on the uh, what you call manufacturer and what is the hardware that we are using so there are a lot of uh, 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 challenges to get the data in this regard. So next, coming to the mobile forensics, we have JTAG, Joint Test Action Group. Uh, so maybe electronic students would be very good uh, in this particular area, I think. So this is a uh, uh, <clears throat> technique which the hardware manufacturers are using to test their hardware, whether it's working fine or not. This is used by the forensicators to extract the content when it when it is seized in any of the uh, criminal cases. So there is uh, something called advanced digital forensics, which is chip off. I have done a lot of uh, chip off, so I have uh, something to say on this. So let us uh, uh, take one scenario where the police uh, has found this uh, person dead on the railway track, and the phone which he was using was very much damaged. So this was uh, uh, this is purely dead, and we can't able to extract using the normal way of uh, extraction. So, uh, so what we did is we we use this technique uh, of chip off, and we learned that, and we try to extract that content. So then we found that it was an homicide uh, in this particular case. So let me show you how it, this can be done. So this is a phone which I have used, and this is the uh, dismantled one. So I'm using reverse station. This is a heating mechanism which I uh, try to remove that chip. This is the chip which I have removed. So let me uh, and also these are the readers which we can use to extract the content. And you can see here there is uh, user data which I have recovered in this particular way. It will be stored in dot bin and uh, this can be used um, uh, to extract the content. So. Uh, I'm successful in extracting the content. So let me show you a, a quick video how this can be done. So this is the uh, damaged phone. So let me forward a bit. So this is how we can remove it. Dismantling that. So one is the uh, processor and another one is uh, another one is uh, the chip which I'm trying to extract the content. This is a rework station. I'm using the heating uh, process. So I'm removing it. So there are a lot of residues on it. The PCB uh, residues are there. So under microscope, I need to clean that. See, this is how we need to clean that. So soldering gun is used. We use a little heat to uh, clean out that to make it readable. So this is how we need it. It's a tedious process. It's not uh, too easy as you look into. So these are the reader which we can use. So Medusa Pro is the box and uh, we use a tool called Medusa Pro. So this will help in extracting. Okay. 
So let me uh, quickly uh, go into some of the cases. Why uh, digital forensics is very important. So let us take a few uh, cases where uh, the uh, forensics has helped us. So there is a case uh, where uh, there was a IT employee who was working in uh, in working as a project manager and he lost 43,500 while using uh, he, he was not having uh, what you call uh, without his consent the 43,500 was uh, debited so let us see that so these are the messages so via he has used uh, someone has used his debit card in the ebay so that okay he is not aware of this when we look at this uh, message and the past message which he has received, uh, that is the past transaction which he has done, he has withdrawn 500 rupees. Then uh, uh, 414 uh, via debit card at Swiggy. So he has used uh, Swiggy transaction which he has used and uh, 500 rupees uh, he has withdrawn from the ATM machine. And this is the fraudulent transaction. That is 43,500, which it has done using eBay. So he has lodged a complaint that he has not done this transaction. Somebody has done the transaction. And he comes to the police station with the with his cell phone and personal laptop in sleep mode. Fine. So on reviewing the statement, it was understood that yes, he has done the transaction in this way. And uh, the OTP was not received for the fraudulent transaction, which I was talking to. Because you should understand that if the gateway is from the if the if the payment gateway is gone by other country other than India, so there is no password required, there is no pin required, and there is no OTP coming into your mobile. So there is no two-factor authentication. So there is no requirement. So whenever uh, when when you have this card details, it's more than enough to do any of the transaction without pin or OTP. So then, they uh, then the examiner thought that this is not the uh, what you call normal way of extracting the OTP uh, like phishing or remote access apps. So they uh, thought of uh, doing analysis on the uh, personal laptop of the victim to understand what has happened. So uh, maybe a malware which is infected in the victim's mission and exfiltrated the data. We don't know that. Let us figure out. So how to uh, examine whether the malware is infected in the system? If infected, what are the files and folders that has infected? And let us also understand what is the behavior of this. So I'm doing here my memory analysis. Many of them may be aware of it. Uh, memory forensics is done on the RAM dump to understand what is the suspicious activity which is done in the RAM. So this is mainly used for uh, understanding or identification of the file list malware. So when we are when we start digging up into it, so we found that there is something called keylog.txt which is created in the system 32, and there is some persistence which is created in the run one and uh, run once and run. So there is some communication with the server as well. So very interestingly, we found that in this process memory, we found that in this process memory which is malicious in nature, we found that dear customer file your IT returns at zero cost check now. So there is some Swiggy transaction which the uh, victim has done. So this is the Swiggy phone number followed by OTP address, then uh, uh, 16 digit card number followed by uh, expiry date, CVV number, name of the card holder and the OTP. So these are the things which was extracted. This is a spyware which was installed in the victim machine and extracted and it was sent to a uh, what you call uh, IP. This is a command and control IP, which is from China. This has happened. So when we dig down to the uh, victim's uh, uh, inbox, we found that there is a phishing mail which says that this is a info, this to inform that income tax department has successfully completed the account audit for this quarter. A review of tax column revealed that you are eligible for the tax refund of eight thousand, which is excessively accumulated over time for your salary account in your bank so please download this it calculator and you can calculate the uh, it by yourself so this was the message which we received so the victim has downloaded this let me show you that also how does the user become victim so he has downloaded this like this 
and uh, he has installed that. Then he has started the transaction in the Swiggy, which was captured and used by the criminals to do this particular uh, fraudulent transaction. Okay. So ransomware, as you are aware, it's a challenge. And uh, even today, we, we don't have the perfect solution for this because this uses public and private key combination to encrypt and uh, uh, decryption. So here, it will be infected and, it, uh, and all the files which is in the system is encrypted and it will ask for the decryption key, which the user doesn't have. And they demand the money for this. So recently what has happened is, uh, many of the companies are uh, getting uh, cyber insurance. So what the criminal has done is, uh, uh, they have infected the uh, cyber insurance company itself and identified who have taken the insurance. And the ransomware attack has been done on those uh, those uh, companies who have the insurance because they are ensuring that they will get the money back. And also, if you look at the uh, uh, ransom which they are asking, it is exactly the same as the uh, insurance client. So let me uh, quit queue of this uh, case study. I have a lot of uh, things. So let me take up this uh, challenges, which is very important. So the, when it comes to challenges, solid state drives, the technical students can also dig into deep into it. Uh, what are the challenges that uh, we are facing in, in the place of uh, using uh, solid state drives when compared to a uh, regular hard disk? Uh, when it comes to uh, using the right blocker, it's very, very difficult uh, in the solid state drive because of uh, uh, using uh, the trim command, garbage collection, and where leveling. The next part is the Apple Mac, which is secured with T2 security, which is very, very difficult to break. And I can say it is impossible without the admin password to extract the content out of it. Then uh, Android phones, uh, many of the uh, devices have uh, customized Android. So th that in that also we are facing a lot of issues to break the password particularly in iPhone. So when it comes to latest phone, uh, latest operating system, again, we have the, a lot of opportunity for you guys to break into that and uh, provide solutions because uh, there are solutions, but it's too costly. And, uh, and those things are not from the uh, manufacturers or not from India. So they're charging so much. And also there are a lot of uh, research required on that. So that's why they are charging so much. The students can definitely take over this. And usage of full disk encryption and file-based encryption in smartphones is creating a lot of challenges for the forensic examiners to extract the content. We can, we can still able to extract the content, but unable to, uh, what you call, uh, decrypt those uh, content. Even with this GPU, we are facing a lot of issues in extracting the content. So cloud extraction is one area where the legal, uh, what you call, lawyers have a lot of role to play because it's only uh, by the agreements uh, or some rules and regulations which can uh, force the cloud service providers to give data to law enforcement to solve the case in this area. So yeah, anyway, definitely the privacy is there, but we need to have some exceptions for law enforcement so that uh, we can do some justice for the case. And also adoption of this technology, which I was talking to, JTA, Chipop, these are the advanced technologies which can bypass the password pattern of this phone. But what about uh, this file, uh, full file, full disk encryption, file-based encryption? Definitely it will not help. Because of these, those advanced techniques are also failing to extract the content. So whenever I say challenges, these are the opportunities for you all to think about how this can be solved. So coming to anti-forensics, so uh, there are a lot of uh, sophisticated uh, uh, criminals nowadays who are very much uh, aware of these kind of techniques, which is creating a lot of uh, uh, what you call a hindrance. And also this is misleading investigation, I can say. One is file deletion. We have a secure wiping. 
where in the one pass we were unable to extract any of the content or recover the data. So stenography, which is also called as hiding the uh, messages in one of other uh, document or uh, images, which is embedded so that we are unable to identify it. So identifying this uh, uh, automatically is, is which is what required. Manually we can do, but there are a lot of files where we can't able to put efforts in identifying each and everything. So hiding data in the registry again, yes, so you need to figure out the way to automate this process of identifying these kind of uh, thing. Then fileless malware, which I already told you about this, uh, it's a challenge again. A uh, lot of the uh, malware, whatever we are looking at, like MO type and all, and uh, the um, the malware which is embedded in the macro, that's PDF or uh, Excel, uh, those are using this kind of fileless malwares. Data encryption, again, it's a uh, huge challenge for everybody to decrypt that. So time stopping, just I wanted to show you this. See, uh, time stopping, uh, we have a solution also because whenever the criminal use this technique, there is a lot, lot of uh, places where it has, where it will create the timestamps. So one such area is uh, US and general, which we use and also there is called standard info file name. So these are the places where we can identify these timestamps. So whenever we find, we, we, we suspect that something is fishy and uh, there is some time stopping has been done. So we, compare in this way there is two attributes one is standard information attribute values then another one is file name attributes so there are a lot of anti forensic tools which help in time stomping where it will time stomp the standard info but not on the file name so we compare so in this case you can see here so uh, there is created uh, file modified mft modified file this is a master file table and all so see so created in 2018, so they have changed it to uh, 2019. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is a 2019 uh, is the correct one, and they have uh, tampered it to 2018. And you can see here all zeros. And this is a fraction of seconds which they have made zeros. It's not that they have done the uh, uh, zeros, they have added zeros, but it's not updated. So they they have only uh, ability to change the date. But this uh, what you call fraction of seconds, they don't have the access to edit. So that's why the, that is one of the uh, suspicious activity where all the uh, what you call microseconds are zero. So then it is suspicious that it is time storm. They are using some of the tools and techniques to uh, what you call change that value. So let me uh, show you in brief uh, whatever the challenges which I showcased. You should look it as an opportunity. One is, uh, let me come to the career building in digital forensic, where we can start from. So this is a uh, uh, seven step process where you can follow this rainbow color. One is to get started, what you should have is the passion. The second one is the degree. Any degree is okay. Technical degree or law degree, because see, uh, this digital forensics field is for the students who have done some of the multidisciplinary courses where the technology is also there, law is also there, and also the privacy. So these three things should be there for any of the uh, forensic investigator to um, what you give justice to his position. There are a lot of books available. So I will share this uh, uh, rainbow thing, so no need to copy. So let me uh, show you this. There are a lot of uh, books available to uh, get into this per, uh, particular digital forensics. One is John Simon who has written uh, the basics of digital forensics, which will create uh, the interest in your mind. Then learning malware analysis from K. Monapa, working with uh, him uh, on many of the trainings. So, so you can definitely look into that. It's a wonderful book. So training and certification. So this is the area which the students can definitely go with because you have one thing uh, which many of the professions are not having is the time. Please utilize the time to uh, do these kind of certifications, which will uh, ignite your mind and 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 it will provide a lot of insights into this particular field and it will create the interest in you. So 
so one is uh, you need to concentrate on uh, vendor neutral certification so that is the first and foremost thing so like you have computer hacking forensic investigator uh, certified forensic computer examiner uh, then san certifications are too good but it's too costly to to a student to get but if you if you get an opportunity definitely go for sans uh, any of the courses one popular course which i have done is uh, gcfa certified forensic analyst which is which talks about advanced digital forensics uh, threat intelligence and instant response these three are very very important topic and that's why that that particular uh, uh, this, uh, this one is very 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 popular and uh, uh, for uh, uh, the uh, person who is uh, from the law background or technical background they can go with this cyber law and cyber forensics that is a pg diploma in the nlsiu which is which is very good they have updated uh, recent uh, things and also there is uh, one course from nalsar university that is advanced diploma in cyber law that will also help you in uh, grasping many of the concepts that's for technical students and this uh, nls you think is for both that will give you a lot of uh, insights vendor specific certification if it is free definitely go 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 for this certification autopsy certification was free you please have a look into it there is some uh, uh, or discount for students and all i think so you please try to understand what is there in that what what that particular tool does so that you can add the what do you call what is not there in that tool and you can build your own tool so other courses or try hack me is one uh, where i found uh, very interesting for a student uh, to that will definitely create an interest it's like a game so it will definitely create an you know, interesting thing then cyberry and there are many uh, things available so coming to uh, this digital forensics uh, so, further understanding there are a lot of free and open source tools uh, let me show you here okay so coming to digital forensics hardware we have ruggedized laptop which is having high configured uh, high configuration uh, where we carry this particular uh, where we will carry this particular thing to create a crime scene for extraction and analysis this is a right blocker which is, will help in uh, blocking the right to the suspect uh, device and still we are able to uh, what do you call view the content so this is a read only uh, which is uh, similar to right blocker so this is a gpu uh, powered workstation which will have lot of gpus to uh, specially used for password breaking and also decrypting the uh, encrypted hard disk and other another uh, workstation with uh, dual monitors and all we have in our lab so this will help this particular workstation has inbuilt for our digital forensic utility which will help to speed up the process mainly okay fine so now uh, coming to invasive forensics which i have already explained so pc3000 also i have already explained so there are a lot of uh, commercial tools also where uh, the students there is a free version please try it out or if you have any academic license in your college please do uh, try to work on these uh, devices so there are disk and uh, memory forensic uh, tools which will automate the process and make uh, forensic examiners life easy so what this does is the one is the acquisition process it will create an image and it will try to classify all the uh, content which is uh, which is there in the system like for example multimedia or uh, documents and uh, other uh, protected files signography uh, files then deleted files so it will classify and it will help so similar with for uh, mobile forensics as well uh, it will mainly help in password breaking and uh, extracting the content from it it is also having lot of classified view uh, especially for the application which uses uh, sqlite database and uh, we can extract the content using that and also analysis so this is a view of all the dongles which we have this mac acquisition is one uh, which is very much helpful for us to uh, extract the content from the macbook 
because uh, it's very difficult to break the password. What we does is we bypass the password using this Mac acquisition. It will boot from the operating system, which is already loaded in this. Uh, then we will try to extract and image the uh, content from that. Also, very interestingly, we have this password recover bundle from Elcomsoft, which has a lot of uh, uh, tools to uh, extract different uh, password or bypass different uh, passwords. So there is something called NIST. So where you have, you can, you will have a lot of, uh, where you have a lot of, uh, what you call uh, images for analysis. So this is the one, uh, there's a computer forensic reference data sets where you have the case scenarios and the image given where you can work and practice at the uh, student level. So there are a lot of domains which you can pick, disk forensics, email forensic, browser, live, memory, network, mobile forensics, data uh, based forensics, cloud forensics and IoT. So IoT is picking up and cloud forensics is also picking up. So it's not that you have learned something, you need to practice, you need to keep updated. So you need to visit some of the blogs and CTFs, you need to uh, try to find out where uh, hackathons is going on, CTFs are going on, especially on digital forensics. So you need to work on that. There is something, uh, Belkosoft is doing, uh, there are a lot of challenges where they're creating regularly. So they put uh, some of the uh, case, uh, scenario and provide the digital forensic challenge. So please attend those things so that you will get to know what is the scenario that the real uh, recent uh, digital forensic examiners are doing. So apply for internship. We also provide internship uh, from CCITR and uh, many of the government organization and also corporate are providing internship in digital forensics. Please have a look. It, it will be changing every time. So this is one, one of the thing which I have put here. So applying the job, so job opportunity, it is in two way. One is the government and the corporate. So there, you believe it or not, there's a lot of demand for digital forensic uh, specialist. So one is central and state law enforcement agencies hiring uh, the private entities. And also there is some, some scheme called cybercrime prevention against women and children. So that is CCPWC. So every state is hiring junior forensic uh, experts and indian cybercrime coordination center i4c from mha it, it is also hiring a lot of people on the contract basis so cyber forensic science laboratories which is situated across india there are six or seven so where you will get a lot of uh, opportunity at the government level corporate you all know i think deloitte kpmg pwc and e and y uh, Accenture, TCS, Wipro, and we also uh, hire a few of them. Mm, the roles will look like a forensic investigator or specialist, you can say. Digital forensic investigator, analyst, investigator again. So what is required for uh, becoming a forensic examiner or analyst, which I have uh, I've already told, but to reiterate, the mindset of investigator is very much required, and you need to know the what is the best practices for collecting the evidence in varied uh, in the diverse media, I can say, variety of devices, how the data is stored, how you can recover the data. So those things are very important in this particular field. So especially cloud and IoT, we have a lot of challenges which is not solved and we have a lot of opportunity to write the research papers and also uh, uh, opt for the internship and all. So analyzing these devices to prove or disprove any particular activity is very important. So incident response, you all you may be aware of this. So one is you need to uh, have the quick thinking, you need to respond faster, you need to have uh, what you call uh, immediate reaction on this, how to identify, mitigate, eradicate, these kind of uh, uh, what you call uh, incidents, especially on containment uh, uh, stage, you need to work a lot more for protecting the systems. OSINT investigator is also one field which is uh, maturing, uh, but uh, it has uh, it has importance at the uh, law enforcement agency than other field. Other roles we have a lot of uh, roles available. Anyway, uh, the the core thing is you need to have that mindset of investigator, 
and you can opt for any of this uh, cyber security uh, digital forensic uh, so i am running out of the time so let me skip this so so any uh, queries uh, let me so, so what i have tried to cover is i wanted to give you uh, what are the uh, trends and uh, latest techniques that we are using so that you can put efforts in uh, uh, addressing those challenges. So, any questions, please let me know. Sorry, I, uh, I was over. Uh, uh, Thank you so much for the expert insights, sir. Uh, uh, we really appreciate uh, that you contributed to the uh, Cyber Security School. Uh, th this has been uh, one of the most in depth and uh, most informative uh, lectures uh, in the school so far. And uh, I, I believe that a uh, lot of our students feel uh, rather reassured that uh, they have plenty of career opportunities uh, within cybersecurity and cyber forensics in particular. Uh, we are a little short on time. Uh, is it okay if we send you uh, the questions that the uh, students uh, typed in the chat uh, to the email address that you uh, put on the screen just now? Sure, sir, sure. Uh, thank you so much, sir, and uh, thank you again uh, for the excellent lecture. Mm -hmm.